This is episode five of a series where we examine the cut content, design, and development of Fallout Tactics. Today's episode is very special, an interview with Tactics lead designer Ed Orman. He did a wide range of work on the project, everything from designing slash coding much of the game, to even drawing all of the new Vault Boy images. He is currently part of an independent development studio in Australia called Uppercut Games, and you can find links to his social media below. To begin, I ask Ed when he joined Microforte and about his responsibilities on Fall Tactics. I started work at Microforte in 1997 as an illustrator, then shifted to design in 1998. Then on Fallout Tactics, I was lead designer and associate producer. With those dual titles, I did a lot of different things. On the design side, I was responsible for the overall direction of the game, liaising with our interplay creative contacts, writing mission design and story, and hands-on gameplay implementation. I also took on the job of drawing Drawing the Vault Boy pictures because it matched my style as an illustrator and because I was greedy. During the course of every game's development, ideas and content are cut for a variety of reasons, so I asked if there were any cut ideas he wished had made it into the final game. I've said before that I preferred the original ending we wrote, where the calculator turned out to literally be a thoughtless machine that was triggering the robots, and it just needed to be turned off. I wish we'd managed to work a recruitable dog meat character into the single player. The calculator is Tactic's main antagonist, a supercomputer that utilizes human brains to increase its processing power. It was originally created to control and regulate the Vault network, but after Vault Zero was breached by Gamoran's super mutant army, the calculator's emergency pacification protocol was initiated. This was a contingency plan put into place in case of a foreign military invasion, mutations, or a breach of Vault Zero's defenses. Due to pre-war budget cuts, the calculator's unfinished programming led it to carrying out this pacification protocol against the entire wasteland. This alternate ending would have been an interesting twist, so I asked Ed to expand on it. My original idea for the big bad of the game was that it wasn't some supervillain, but instead a system that was put in place by pre-war people with terrible foresight. So it couldn't be reasoned with, and it wasn't a bad guy. It was a device just performing its function. But we would build it up in the story to be something like the Master from Fall 1, with its own followers, etc. Then the reveal at the end of the game was that you just had to turn it off. The single player missions were numbered internally 1 through 26, but the 13th, 14th, 18th, and 20th missions are missing. Several of these revolved around the Reavers, a faction of technology worshipping raiders that feels underdeveloped in the final game. They first appear in the Junction City mission, and attack the settlement to retrieve the parts of a destroyed robot. They then appear in the Newton mission, and have nearly been annihilated by the calculator. After that, the Reavers are essentially disbanded and put into labor camps or set free. Intrigued, I ask Ed if he remembered anything about these cut missions. Not really, smiley face. The Reavers were meant to be similar to the Raiders, but with a bit more knowledge of technology. I am almost certain their role was cut down for production reasons, but it might also not have helped that their story was underdeveloped. There's references to multiple cut vehicles in the game files, and early images even depicted vehicle combat. Further, there's relatively few missions that even allow the use of vehicles in the final game. So I ask Ed if vehicles were once planned to be a more major aspect of Tactics gameplay. I don't know about major, but we did intend them to have a larger role, yes. The reality was that they had a number of production and gameplay issues. We had a hard time balancing their use tactically. The sprite engine wasn't really great at handling sprites of that size, or movement at speed. And real vehicles don't turn on a dime as our characters did, so they always looked a bit janky. The memory footprint of them was enormous compared to a combatant on foot. Looking back, I don't think the game even really needed vehicles, but that was part of the problem of my approach to design at the time, which I'll get into below. 
Tactics had one of the most brutal development cycles I've ever heard of. It was a massive game that had both a single player campaign and online multiplayer modes, but it was made by a small, inexperienced team who were working on an IP that was new to them in a new engine and they were only given 15 months to complete it. They were then only given a few weeks for QA, a ridiculously short amount of time for an RPG, leading to the final game having a notable number of bugs. The more I researched, the more I got behind a narrative that Interplay in some ways sabotaged Tactics development, and I asked out about it. No, I think the people at Interplay were doing their best to make sure the game succeeded. They were under a whole different set of business pressures, not all of which we were privy to. After Tactics went gold, Interplay revealed they weren't interested in producing a sequel. Microforte then went all in on their MMO server technology called Big World, and laid off nearly the entire team that made Tactics. From what I've been able to gather, these layoffs happened several days before Tactics even released. Layoffs are unfortunately common in the industry at the end of a game's development, but I ask if this was handled as terribly as it sounds. The reality was that without the contract to continue, Microforte didn't have the money to support the dev team. That happens in game development, and I believe couldn't have been avoided. More because of where Interplay was at than Microforte, so that made it feel extra terrible. Knowing that our team had done a great job on tactics, but it didn't matter. But the layoffs themselves were handled awfully, insensitively, for the people being let go. They were forced to all sit in a meeting with everyone who wasn't being laid off, and then hear a pep talk about how everything would work out for the people who still had jobs. At some point prior to Tactics' release, work began on a sequel, but it was unfortunately later cancelled. The team was poised to make a great follow-up, considering the experience of the first game and more knowledge of the Fallout IP under their belt. Ivan Buren mentioned that Microforte was working internally on a 3D engine, while concept artist Tariq Rahim made multiple pieces of concept art depicting a mutated alligator enemy. So I asked Ed if he remembered any ideas the team had for Fault Tactics 2. I remember that Tony Oakton came up with a terrific new Big Bad for the sequel, based on mutated intelligent plants. I really liked that idea, and the way we were going to build them up over the course of another campaign. The alligator was probably because we were pushing towards swamps as a new environment. I think we planned the campaign to be shorter and more focused. Definitely heavier on the tactics, less on the story, although it would still be the backbone of the campaign. Pretty sure we would have ditched random encounters. The 3D engine was indeed in the works. I believe programmer Peter Wake was pushing for something like it even during tactics development. One obstacle was our production pipeline wasn't set up for low poly, but the end result looked terrific and let us make use of some graphics acceleration and lighting that we couldn't do with sprites. My memory is fuzzy, but I do think that if we could have secured funding, it would have been a good direction to go in. I wish there was footage of it. Next, I ask if working on tactics changed his approach to game design. Absolutely. It was my first real crack at lead designer, so I knew nothing about what I was doing, and there wasn't much in the way of experienced advice given to me either. And I was too defensive, not open to criticism, not willing to bend. My biggest weakness at the time was a tendency towards laundry list design. Write a list of everything possible and then put it all in the game. So instead of choosing a single thing to iterate on and make sure it was fun, I made us go broad and do everything at once. I also felt I had a lot to prove. If the previous Fallout games had a feature, then we needed to have it too, and do it better, and then have more things on top, like vehicles. I didn't know how to pick my battles or focus on what mattered. The result of all of that was a lack of focus and a lot of wasted work. We could have done less with more and turned out a more polished product. Then I asked if he had any standout memories from the game's development. Too many, really. That team went through development hell and layoff hell, but I still remember that time very fondly. 
a great group of people driven to do their best. I do remember learning about the Gold Masters. The final physical version of the final game used to make all copies, and having our Interplay producer just yell at the manufacturers to press the fucking button and get it out the door. Nearing the end of our interview, I ask if he had any advice for aspiring game developers. Seek out advice from other designers, read articles and books, play a variety of games, video, board, card, etc., and put what you learn into practice. Make something in an existing game engine, a level, a character, or a whole minigame. Finally, I ask what projects he's currently working on. I don't have anything I can discuss, so instead I'll give a shout out to Broken Roads. It's an Australian post-apocalyptic strategic turn-based game, very much in the vein of the old Fallouts, and I'm looking forward to it a lot. Check out their Steam page and give them a wish list if that sounds like your kind of thing. Broken Roads is currently slated to release sometime next year and looks amazing, so if you want to check it out, I've left some links below. Huge thanks to Ed Orman for the interview, and thank you so much for watching. Have an awesome day, guys.